Welcome, everybody, to the Yo Kid Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Gargano. This is the podcast that surrounds everything youth sports. So I've covered pro and college sports the highest level, and I have fallen in love with youth sports. I'm a big believer in sports for children. I, I just think it's a, it's such a great, a, uh, great outlet and keeps them out of trouble. Keeps them. They learn so many great life lessons. So as we go forward with the podcast, we're going to be talking to a lot of different people in the world of youth sports. We'll talk to some professional athletes who have children of themselves. We'll talk about the journey of the athlete. We'll highlight some of the terrific youth uh, sports athletes across the Delaware Valley and beyond. Uh, But really, we really wanted to try to give some advice to the parents. Listen, if you got a good story, good idea, please, like I said, hit me up and we'll get to it. Yo Kids Sports Podcast. And don't forget, our Yo Kids Sports Podcast is presented by P- Primo Hoagies. Listen, know what I've always said for years and years and years. It's not just a hoagie. It's a Primo. And uh, this fall, whether you're tailgating, football, soccer, it's youth, you name it, make sure you got your Primo Hoagie party tray. Nothing like it for the big game. And speaking of football and the big game... This fall, we're giving away a trip to Vegas to see the very big game to one very lucky, very deserving coach. So if you know a youth coach that you think deserves recognition for their outstanding dedication and passion, make your nominations today. Primohogies.com. You can go directly mvc.primohogies.com. Our most valuable coach promotion here at Primo's, I love it. We, we got to shine some love, give some love to these youth coaches that spend their time, many of whom uh, just get an earful and <laughs> no compensation. So they're the best. Nominate your favorite coach. Again, it's the uh, Primo Hoagies Most Valuable Coach Contest. I love it. I think it's great. And who knows, maybe they'll get to see uh, the birds at the big game. Wouldn't that be something? I, I am thrilled right now to be joined by one of the great baseball people in all the Delaware Valley, Penn coach John Yurkow. First, John, listen, I got to say congratulations on an incredible run in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I appreciate that, Anthony. It was, uh, you know, we set a lot of records and milestones. It was a lot of fun, man, uh, having the opportunity to first win the Ivy league tournament at home in front of our fans, and then actually go down to the NCAA regional and, and upset the number one seed Auburn on the road in front of all those people down there. Um, you know, and yeah. And, 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 then, <laughs> and then get Sanford after and we were one game away from going to a super regional, going to Knoxville to play Tennessee. Couldn't pull it off at the end, but yeah, it was, it was a great run. I appreciate it, man. It was great. I'll tell you what, Anthony, like, having me on the show and just all the people at home following along. It really was awesome, man. It was a great experience for the kids. Well, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast is to highlight a lot of the kids from our area. And, you know, between there's so much good talent here. It's amazing. I mean, look, let's, let's look, we're going to talk baseball. We'll talk all sports, but we're going to talk baseball tonight and look at all the kids from this area that, you know, have, have done a great, they're already up McCormick in, with Houston. There's a million of them. The kid Schneider hit another home run for Toronto last night. I know it, it really is. We've been in a really good cycle. I feel like for the last six or seven years between, um, you know, the, the, from Philly to the, to the suburbs, the PA suburbs and South Jersey for, for high school baseball, it's been awesome for a while now. And you're seeing like a lot of kids have an opportunity to get drafted um, you know, and do really well and, and, and make it to the big leagues. I mean, there's some there's some guys that have done really, really well. Zach Gallon, Bishop Eustace yeah. kid, right? Tearing He's it up. He's going to Young. I know. That's amazing. Um, so there's a there's a bunch of guys right now. It's, it's great to see for our area. Um, I think it speaks volumes to the, some of the good, some of the good, like the quality of the coaches in the area, you know, yeah. the development side of things. I think we're really fortunate where we live. Um there's a lot of good coaches at the youth level, uh, at the high school level. And it's, I think that's why you're seeing a lot of these kids have so much success in pro ball. And, you know, one of the things I, I love about what, what you've done at Penn, I mean, you talked about 
one of the great institutions in the country, is that you know you you look all around the all around the country for kids that can play, but you also look in the area because there is a treasure trove, and you know that what it wouldn't it imagine like we all have dreams to be in the bigs, but guess what? To get an Ivy League education, to get a, an education at Penn, what a gift that is. Yeah, that's the I guess that's the gift that keeps on giving, right? I mean, it's that's one you take with you, and, and when we have recruits come in. You know, Anthony, it's like you're going to be there for four years and obviously everybody wants to chase that dream. And you can do that at Penn. You know, Mark DeRosa, Doug Glanville, Jake Cousins most recently, you know, guys that had a chance to play in the big leagues. But, you know, for so many guys, you know what the chances of that, you know, of really fulfilling that dream. It's nice to know that you get a degree from Penn. That's that's a pretty good insurance policy to have in your back pocket. You know, it's going to open up a lot of doors for you. So let's let's look about the road. And I'm really curious the road to college. Mm-hmm. And when do you start kind of really getting kids on your radar and when this whole process starts? Because I think a lot of parents, look, it's expensive to play travel baseball, right? I have a kid and, you know, bats are 400 bucks. You know, there's league fees and there's travel and hotels and all that stuff. It's very expensive. So it'd be nice, like, if you get a little help, at college, the college league, get them through playing high school. You never know. Any little help work, you know, would be great. But it's it's a journey. And when does the journey for the youth start for you as the coach at, at a university? Yeah, I, well, I think I want, I'd like to start off by saying I think that there's still a lot of value in playing multiple sports when you're younger. I don't think that kids need to – you know, really focus in on one sport too early on, you know, and I, you know, when you grew up, when I was growing up, it's like whatever season it was, was the sport that you played. Right. Right. And now it's, it's become so um, like streamlined. People are really trying to drive kids to play like one sport. Right. And really try to specialize in one sport. And I guess like if you're going to do it, I think it's great for kids, maybe up until they're like 12, 13 years old, to, you know, play different sports, whether it's football or ice hockey or soccer. I think that stuff's great for you. And, and then eventually, I think you, you may have to, unless you're like this phenomenal athlete where things just kind of come easy for you, um, you know, at some point you're going to have to make a decision on, on which avenue you're going to go. At that point, maybe it's like eighth grade. I don't know. It's different for every kid where you really got to say, you know, when you're looking to pick a high school, maybe, right. And you're, and you're looking at a specific sport, that's when it starts to play into you know, like your decision, maybe to, to go, uh, you know, and, and kind of specialize in one sport, but it's a little different for everybody on our end. It, it's crazy because when I first started co- coaching in college and I've been coaching like over 20 years now, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, but it's, you know, back then you wouldn't start recruiting kids until like, maybe just before their senior year, like late that summer. Well, we have three kids that are 2025s. So these kids have just started their junior years that are committed to come here already, you know, and there's some bigger schools that probably have eight or nine commitments in that class. They may have some kids committed in the 2026 class, which is wild. You know, those kids are just starting their sophomore year. They don't, those kids don't know what they want to do at this point, you know, you know, it's, it's wild. It's definitely sped up. And what starts to happen, the bigger schools started that. And then everybody starts to trickle down. Everybody starts to follow suit. And then, you know, it's kind of like keeping up with the Joneses. If everybody else is doing it, it kind of forces you to do the same thing. Right. So that's kind of where things are, um, at least with baseball. I think like, you know, the end of the sophomore year going into the junior year, the junior year fall for us is a, is a critical time, you know, and, and we'll follow kids that are juniors now. Um, if we're identifying kids, we might try to get them to come like a winter camp, see them in their high school season or early in summer ball. But yeah, it's, it's, I would say two years out from graduation is a, a kind of a benchmark now to, to at least be kind of on that path. Do you, if, do you allow kids to come on your radar even earlier just to, you know, almost sketch it out. It's a kid to follow a name to follow. Yeah, that happens all the time. Um, you know, and you, you mentioned it earlier, like we, we recruit nationally, we have to, but I'd still say like 50, 60% of our roster is from the Northeast quarter. Um, 
and a bunch of those kids are from from PA, Philly, and and New Jersey. You know, um, but yeah, we we'll get emails from kids uh, or coaches or call us contacts that we have around the country. Um, you know, I I say to people all the time, it's it's a blessing and a curse that you get to recruit nationally because some schools are regionalized. If that local area is down for a couple of years, you get what you get, right? Where we can go, we can go to California, we can go to Texas, we can go to the Midwest to get kids, you know? So that's, but it's a big United States too, right? And you can't be everywhere. So at that point, you're really relying on your contacts that you have in those states, whether it be travel ball coaches that you've worked with for a long time, guys that you can really trust. There's a lot of guys out there when it comes to travel baseball, you know, it's a, it's a business, yeah. right? as you know. Yeah. Yeah. And and when people are making decisions on what's best for their business, that might not be what's best for college coaches in terms of recruiting and trusting those opinions. Right. So it's it's a delicate, you know, it's kind of a fine line and you got to figure out pretty quickly from a from a coach's perspective who you can trust and who, you you know, and that way when you do get a call from a guy, you're like, all right, we got to see this kid. Like that's, this is a guy we need to see. Um, and that's kind of how that starts. What do you advise? So let's, let's look, let's start with the journey of, you know, eight, nine, 10, you, mm-hmm. and you have these kids and like you said, play multiple sports, but you know, there is a pressure to play fall ball. There's a, pl- there's a pressure for all season workouts. Like, it, you know, it's interesting because I coached little league and in the rec ball. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you had kids and this is a shame for the game because you had kids that really couldn't belong on the same field as the travel ball players because it would legitimately, they would get hurt. You had kids hitting line drives to kids that really don't know how to hold their glove, protect themselves. So they almost didn't belong in the same field at 10, 11 years old. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's changed, right? Back when, when I was growing up, there was no travel ball. So everybody played for their local their local teams, their local yeah. neighborhood, right? Their local township or municipality. So that forced more. I think the quality was probably better, right? Because that's all you had. And now what's happening you know, those, the better players are going, they're finding travel ball teams earlier on. And it's like, Hey, we can go down the Ripken. We can go to Myrtle beach. We can go yeah. up to this place. Right. We go up to the Poconos for the PBR. weekend. Yeah. 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 You got PBR. You go up to uh, J- Jack Cust up the diamond nation, right? There's all these places you can go to. We can go to, uh, to uh, uh, up there at uh, Cooperstown. They've got tournaments and everywhere. Yeah. Right. And next thing you know, every weekend you're staying in a hotel with your 10 year old kid and then five thousand dollars later, you're like, wait a minute, what just happened here? You know? <laughs> so, and that's not even including all the equipment that you have to have and everything else, right? So it's it's yeah, it's interesting. I don't I think like and I, I get it, I got a lot of buddies, you know, that have kids that are coming up now and they say the same thing. It's like, listen, like the local stuff, my son's not gonna get anything out of it if a kid can't play catch, and that's unfortunate, right? And I think what's happened with some of the better players leaving the local scene it's taken some of the good local coaches away from it too. Yeah. So, you know, those eight to 10 year old kids might not be getting instruction that they got 15 years ago, you know, because yeah. let's face it. A lot of the kids that are better players, their dads are probably coaching them when they're younger. So it's not only is the players leaving, but those coaches are leaving too, that maybe played like they were good high school players or they played right. in college. Right. So they're good. They could be potentially good coaches, good role models for those types of kids, you know, to keep them involved. And, Baseball is a sport where I feel like there's so much failure. If you don't teach kids how to deal with that failure, at nowadays it's like, listen, I'll go play PlayStation. You know what I mean? Like I don't need, I don't need this anymore. The truth, yeah. and you know what? And like I, I saw, I love the game. I, I, you know, it's funny because I saw this kid. I had a kid, rec ball kid, and he was in tears, and he's like, I don't want to play. I don't want to mm-hmm. play. My dad makes me come here. Right. And it's hard because if you're the dad, right? Like you want your kid, forget about, you know, going to play for, you know, Coach John York, Al Penn. You just want your kid to be outside getting vitamin D. Yeah. Running right. around. You know, yeah. baseball is Americana. Yeah, it's at that point, it's like, listen, go play a team sport, right? 
learn what all the all the positives that can come out learn about like dealing with adversity being a good teammate right um you know picking your teammates up that they're the things that like no matter what sport you're playing there's so much value especially for younger kids it doesn't matter what the sport is really you know and there's so many life lessons i think that can be learned from you sports yeah. and it's a shame to think like kids they have a bad experience and that one bad experience just might turn them away and then they don't they don't really get to experience that moving forward and I, I, I got to tell you, like, the kid was breaking my heart because he didn't want to be there. And I'm just looking at him I'm like, come on, buddy. You know, like, why yeah. you, just try, just try for it. You know, yeah. try for it. And it's it's tough. And then you just see the disparity. And that was a big thing that struck me that was different, like you said, from when we were kids. And I was growing up and, you know, the better kids played Legion. And, you know, we all like we all. That's how we differentiate it, right? Like you didn't, right. you know, it was a little different. So kids play, like you play, you play. There's something special about playing baseball, right? And, you know, I, I think I, I love the travel ball scene and I think it's great for them. It's pretty, pretty intense. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you know, we, we're now in 10, we're, we were in 10U in the spring. We're moving up to 11U and that's a whole new game, right? It's Leeds. Mm-hmm. It's the game changes in a big way at 11 U and now you're teaching pretty skilled kids, like the real nuances of the game. What, what mm-hmm. advice would you have for, you know, coaches, especially at that when we're, as we're going through the journey, the 10 to 11 U kids. Yeah. I think like when I was playing, the big jump was from when you went to like, you're from 12 years old from the small field. Right. And then you went from 60 foot to 90 foot. Yeah. Right. Yeah, now, yeah. at least I will say one of the good things is now they have like a tweener, right, yes. where you don't make the bigger jump. Right. Yeah. So I think there's I think there's some positives in that where they're kind of slowly working kids into that, you know, the field that you're going to play on in high school and, and college and, and professional baseball. So I do think that is good because I think some of the kids that may have kind of fallen off because they couldn't make the long throw from third base. So, they, you know, what I mean, some of those kids that maybe aren't as developed physically, yeah. it allows those kids to, to, to continue to play and participate. Um, but it's tricky. I think, you know, and you, and you see it right now with your kids, like you got to have a catcher that can handle the ball. You got to throw strikes. They're like the two main things. If you don't have those, then you know, right. you're going to get boat raced every, every weekend you go out right. there. Right. And the games are, they're no fun for anybody. Right. Um, but yeah. And then you start mixing in leads and then, you know, which what, what the good part about it, is you are teaching those little things, the subtleties of the game when kids are a little younger. So you would hope that by the time kids get to high school, they have a better idea. You would hope and think by the time they showed up to the University of Pennsylvania that I don't need to teach a kid how to bunt. Right. Not, not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> that has the, changed, baby. Well, that's the, the difference. Part of the bunt. Oh God. And like, whether it's bunting or base running, look, knowing what to look for on a steel break, you know, stuff like that. Um, and this is what really concerns me about travel baseball in a nutshell, Anthony, I would be okay with it if there were more practices for travel baseball. And there are some teams that do it the right way and they work on those types of things. And when we go watch and recruit, you can tell what teams have been coached. Yeah. yeah. But there are some teams, it's like, hey, guys, we'll see you Thursday at, you know, at Ripken. We got five games on the weekend. Little Jimmy, you'll throw Thursday. Pete, you're throwing Friday. And then we'll throw the gloves out and see what we got, right? And then there's no practicing. And then then the tournament ends. Hey, guys, great job. You finished in third place. We'll see you next Thursday when we go down this, you know. So it's just one tournament after another, and, and that's all you're doing. The other problem with that, too, I think a lot of the arm injuries that we were having now, yeah. especially at the younger level, yeah, there's too much baseball crammed into a, a small time period, right? I watch high, I I'll watch high school coaches, and I've had to do this where we have a kid coming in the next year. It's going to be a freshman, and you know they're in the playoffs. They got a game on Tuesday, and a kid throws. You know, some of these states don't have rules when it comes to pitch counts yet. Some mm-hmm. do, which right. is good. Right. Kid throws 120 pitches down in Texas on a Tuesday and they want to run, run him back out on Saturday and let him go as long as he can. And it's like, listen, like we wouldn't do that at Penn. So why are you doing that in high school? Right. 
And that's the other part of this too. And, and if you don't have, you know, some of these coaches that have the knowledge of how to like build kids up with pitch counts too, that's, I mean, that's a whole science in itself, you know, and you're starting to see kids at younger ages, 12 year old kids with Tommy John surgery. Now that was unheard of back when I was well, growing I, up. I, I had a parent, I, I over, well, in a conversation, almost forcing Tommy John because he thought it it would get it over with and he'd get more velo out of it. Yeah, I know. Parent, I'm glad that one of the things I don't have to deal with, I have a lot of buddies that coach at the high school level in the area. And some of the stories that they, you know, that they tell me, it's crazy, man. Like parents showing up at their house, knocking on their door, oh. wondering why so and so their son's not playing and he's better than this kid. And that's one of the things in college that you really, you don't have to deal with. Um, and <laughs> so I feel I feel for those some of those high school coaches. We, uh, I was in fact, we had a uh, an eighth grade football, right, seniors football, eighth grade the other day was a practice, it was scrimmage. Parent comes out and starts late right afterwards. He says, I'm going to wait for the kid to walk away. And then proceeds to undress the coach in a profanity-laced diatribe. Mm -hmm. I mean, language that was unsuitable for you and I, right? Right. And God bless the coach because the coach showed great patience and was like, listen, you you really need to calm down. And this is why we have a 24-hour rule. Mm -hmm. And, right, like, you, you really have to understand, like, your son, a lot of these kids didn't get to play today was because the other team brought all their seniors, no JV, they would get hurt. They already got mm-hmm. one kid hurt. So you have to understand, like the parents have to understand that, you know, listen, even though they may not play, they are gaining understanding of the game. Sure. Right? Like, John, you see this all the time. Like, you know, they, like listen, every, every parent wants their kid to play. And every kid wants to play. But sometimes you need to watch and learn the game. Yeah, it's it's funny. We had our first fall practice today, and we had oh, our, our te- yeah first first team meeting yesterday. And I, I, I one of the things I talked about, we had a young man, South Jersey kid, right, Ryan Drumboski. Um, he's from Northern Burlington High School. His freshman year, you know, big kid, good body kid, but he he was trying. He needed to figure some things out, and he would tell you that. I think it's like five or six innings his freshman year for us. Last year. Ivy League Pitcher of the Year. He's the kid that beat Auburn on Friday night in the regional, you know, wow. and he's like, he's a dude, you know, and yeah. I, and I brought that up. A lot can change in a year, and and by watching and learning, if you're the right type of kid, you can get a lot better, you know, so there's something to be said for that, too. What's the role? Let's look at the role of puberty, right? When it, Especially when you're looking at, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, like that window that went, because you you just see kids, you know, one one day they look like babies, and the next they're, they have deep voices, and all of a sudden you can see them sprout and you, they start to to grow. How like when you're looking at teaching the game, and I was trying to tell somebody this that, and I'm curious if you think it's correct that you almost need to wait until they go through it to really decide what the kid's going to be. You don't know what his position is going to be. You don't know what his body type's really going to end up. There's so yeah. much unknown. Yeah, and I, I could even take it to like when kids are work, like we're t- recruiting kids when they're 15 and 16. We we have a kid in our program now that we recruit him. He was like this wiry kind of skinny kid when he was like going into his, his junior year. And I thought that I liked his actions. And we thought he was going to be a really good shortstop. By the, by the time the kid showed up on campus, he basically grew out of the shortstop position. You know, and we, we wound yeah. up moving him and he he's a two way guy for us, but he pitches and he plays first base and he's a really good defensive first baseman. He used to play shortstop. Right. And he closed for us last year. But like if you would have told me when we were recruiting that kid that he was going to get that that much bigger and stronger, I would have said there's no way. So and even at that age, you still you know, you don't know when a kid's 16. I've had kids come to college and, you know, you hear it like sometimes with like basketball players, they'll grow when they get to college a couple inches. You know, yeah. but yeah, and I always see a big difference in our kids when they leave after their freshman year and come back like that summer and they start to look more like men. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's their body. Yeah. You go yeah. from being an 18 or 19 and 19 to 20 and the body start changing and guys really start to to get become more physical. But like, as you said, even at like Little League, like I'm watching the Little League, the, the highlights, 
the kid that hit the home run for California to win it, he was like six foot two, he looked like, you know? <laughs> so it's like, what are you doing These out kids there? are amazing. I mean, I, yeah. how about the kid from uh, uh, China who threw that 81 mile an hour slider, man? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I know. And that's the thing. I think especially at like that 12 year old, you can have some kids that are like fully grown. And then you got like this other kid, like I uh, probably like me, where I was like the smallest kid on the team all the time, you know, but you got to watch because like sometimes kids peak. Right. And th they're the, the hardest thrower on the team and they can get away with just being the biggest kid and they're better. And then what you start to see happen, those kids finish growing and the kids that had to learn how to play the game the right way, they keep getting better. And then eventually they hit that growth spurt and that kid winds up becoming the better player. What do you advise? Do you, you advise, you know, regular hitting lessons? You know, we were talking about, you know, the you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade and, and that and that that kind of thing, the 10, 11, 12, 13 you regular pitching lessons, hitting lessons. Do you say, you know, just your coach? Do, what, what do you do for extracurricular stuff to work on things? Do you, do you even believe in that? And is it a waste? Because a lot of parents are like, oh, man, I, I need to get my kid, you know, regular hitting. And, you know, I need my get, get, get my kid regular pitching. I think, you know, it, it depends. I think if a parent has has played and they have some knowledge of the game, I think that can be adequate for a kid when they're younger. I think you get to a certain point, though, you, you, you may be better off handing them over to somebody with a little bit more experience. Right. Whether that's like the age of 13 or 14. Um, you know, and then you start getting them some more individualized instruction. I think that's okay at times, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you this quick story. This was awesome. So you'll love this. One of the things that kids don't do anymore, very rarely will you drive by a baseball field nowadays and just see like eight kids with no adults playing baseball. Like, yeah, it's unheard of. If you saw that now, you'd be like, wait a minute, what's going on? This is weird. <laughs> right. Right. The way there's no parents involved. So I'm, I'm at a Legion game about six weeks ago in New Jersey, watching this kid play. And there's a little league facility right next to it. And it's like a hundred degrees and I'm sweating and it's so hot. Right. And all of a sudden I hear like kids voices, like kids playing. So I kind of look over, there's like four little league fields. There's about 12 kids. And I see them all taking their hats off and throwing them in a circle. No parents. Oh, and they're picking teams by picking hats. I'm like, D dude, this is awesome. Ah. Like, this is like old school, right? Yes. It was like a, it was like a scene out of Sandlot. That's what it reminded me of. Right? Oh, I love it. So they're they're playing wiffle ball on this little league field, but they're running bases, and they got their rules. And they they say we're playing. Uh, what are we saying? We're playing dirt bag rules today. I hear the one kid saying. So that means you can peg. We got pegs in between first and second. And I'm like, this is great. I wind up going over and watching this game for like 15 minutes. Right. It was like it was awesome. And um, I had so much fun watching those kids because to me, like, that's what my youth was like. We would right. play bounce pitch tennis ball in the street in the summer all day. Your parents said, get out of the house. I'll see you at dinner or I'll see you at lunch. Mm -hmm. We'll go back out. Nobody knew where we were. I'm not saying that's the best thing, the best way, best way to do it. But that's how it was. And you just learn from playing all these different sports and experiencing things. And it. To me, that when I think of growing up and being a young kid and falling in love with baseball, that's what I think of. That's what I think of playing uh, wiffle ball or my dad. Started. My dad taught me how to play stick ball with the half pimple ball. And yeah. my parents are from South Philly, so like he <laughs> he brings this broomstick out. I said, "What are we doing with this?" <laughs> and then he brings his ball out, and it's it's all roughed up, and it's got the dimples on it. And he goes, "Yeah, it's a dimple ball." Yeah. I said, "It's only half a ball." He goes, yeah, that's, that's where it's supposed to be like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. You know what's yeah. funny? The, it, our baseball coaches, they hate us playing half ball because you would have such a – and it's funny, talk about launch angle. They hated it because, when you know, when Phil, in Philadelphia you had the side streets, right? So yeah, sure. You had the little streets. Yep. So you'd want to roof them, right? So your swing is completely – uppercut and so your launch angle trying to, to try to get it over over the side street and and they used to say stop playing half ball stop playing half ball it's yeah. gonna wreck your swing yeah because you know, all they taught was 
you know, level. Get on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They threw it. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. That was the original launch angle explosion right there back in <laughs> South Philly with the pimple ball. Who would have thought it? <laughs> That's fantastic. So ultimately, when you look at kids, when we, when we continue the journey in high school, you know, what do you recommend? Because I know there's, you know, all kinds of uh, showcase tournaments. A friend of mine, you know, he was in Georgia, back and right. forth to Georgia at there. Like, it, it's wild, man. It's yeah. some of that stuff is is intense. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, honestly, Anthony, you could be at a different event every weekend in the summer if you really wanted to, right? Whether it be with your team at a tournament or, you know, these showcases have, have really exploded in the last 10 years where it's more individualized kids signing up. They know that there's going to be a bunch of college coaches there watching them. And I think, like, I think it's okay to do a couple, sh like, showcases. You don't need to go crazy, you know. And and then if your, your summer team is going to travel a lot, if you're good, the bottom line is people will see you. Yeah. That's really what happens, you know. And I don't think you need to go nuts spending thousands of dollars, you know, and, and going over, you know, going to California and going to Texas and doing this and doing that. You know, I think you go to, you get a, your, some video out there. That's one of the great things now about video. We like if a kid emails us now, every kid can send a small video clip and we can just hop in there, watch it for 30, 40 seconds and be like, Hey, this is an interesting kid. Why don't we follow up? Right. You send the kid an email, maybe invite the kid to come visit, maybe attend one of your camps where you can bring kids in like a one day camp, two day camp. I think there's some value in that too. Like the sooner a, a student athlete can kind of figure out what schools they're looking at, right. the better, because like, you know, it, no, like no offense, but Penn's a lot different than maybe a state school in the Midwest. Right. Right. Sure. So it, usually if you're maybe you're looking at Penn, maybe you're looking at like a Duke or a Vanderbilt or another Ivy League school. Right. Like a good, you know, better academic schools. So that might be, you know, you want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Right. Um, I always think it's interesting. We'll be recruiting a kid. He'll be like, yeah, we're looking at Penn. We're looking at Boston College, Northwestern. And I'm looking at Florida State. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> one of these things doesn't fit here. You know what I mean? So. Um, you know, sometimes kids just don't know what they want yet too. And, and that you see that a little bit too, but yeah, there's a lot of different things. I think it's okay to answer your question, to go to a couple showcases, mm -hmm. get your name out there because all these showcases now, there's usually a video component and they'll rate you. They'll get your 60 time. They'll get all your metrics. So that stuff will be out there for the, for the public to see. So it's very easy. If Anthony Gargano sends me a, a video or sends me, Hey, an intro letter, I can Google your name and within 20 seconds, it's going to pop up if you went to a perfect game event or a PBR event. Right. And we're going to get in there right away and be like, all right, this guy's worth seeing. Right. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that the internet's really changed too. Yeah. That's wild. Man. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and they're looking at you know, pop up time and they're looking at all kinds yeah. of eggs below. And how important are those analytics to you? Yeah. It's a, uh, there's there's value in it but like we had a kid last year he graduated for his last year um and he was a catcher from houston and i was down in houston recruiting this probably like five or six years ago and here you talk about travel ball and teams that do it the right way and down in texas there's a this this premier league and it was like 16 teams nobody cares about who wins this tournament right they send everything out you're going to play four or five games you go down, it's like late June in, in Houston. So it's like 148 degrees. Right? <laughs> so it, you basically, if you're not in the shade, you're going to melt, right? So, <laughs> and I'm watching this kid. He weighs about 155 pounds and he's catching and he's backing up first base. In one game, he back picks a guy at first. He throws a guy out at second and then he back picks a guy at third. This little skinny kid, and I remember when I'm watching him, and I'm watching him back up first base, and then he doubles, and like, and I'm like, man, this kid, he's really undersized, but he's a really good player. So I go back to see him the next day. Anthony, again, he's he, just balling, right, doing everything right. He's dirty, it's hot, he's diving all over the place, and he's got some skills he could really throw. So I get on the phone and I tell I tell the coaching staff, I said, you guys are going to think I'm nuts because I knew they were going to run right to his profile online and check them out and i know what the kid looks like physically right, right. i said but i i told him i said listen i will we'll take this kid right now because even if he hits 260 his entire career 
he's worth it because he's that good of a defender behind the plate, right? Light hitting catcher, but can really handle the staff and throw, shut the running game down. Long story short, we take him. He winds up coming to Penn. He gains about 25 pounds, right? He's the kid that that wound up homering against Auburn in the regional to beat him in the eighth inning. He wow. hit like 320, all IV player, switch hit and catcher. He had one year eligibility left because he graduated. So he's playing his grad year down at Texas A&M this year for them. Oh, um, that's wild. But but my point is, if you went to a showcase and you you watched him, he would not, he wouldn't have stood out. Sure. It's you still got to watch kids play the game and watch them yeah. and see what they're like instinctually too. That's a that's a big part of it for me. That's funny because I I knew that like I knew you look at the game like you know what do they understand is it innate in them to understand the game and where to go and and because you know it, it's like you know I know where to throw I know where that throw needs to go I know what base you know what base that throw needs to go I know all these little nuances of the game, which is beautiful about baseball, that kids, you know, like they don't show. The Chase Utley thing doesn't show, right? Like right. in the analytics. Right, right. And that's something that, yeah, you, know, you get enough of those kids on your team and you're going to have a good team. I yeah. mean, I, I, obviously you've got, they've got to be talented kids, right? There's got to be like a baseline. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but like, like, you start looking at it and you start playing deep into the postseason. All the teams are talented. Like what yeah. separates one team? You know what I mean? Like you took it off with the NFL or, or, you know, they're all talented. What makes one team that much better than, than the other? It's just, it, the margins are slim when you get yeah. to that level. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Do you, um, what, what do you, uh, what do you recommend as far as kids when you're looking at, you know, when do they throw re- like really move making curveballs and sliders and, you know, handle and you talked about because I thought it was really interesting how you talked about pitch counts and and it's so important because because you're playing fall ball and because you got winter workouts you're throwing so much. I think that's one of the issues. It's 100%. just percent practice too. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think developmentally with with kids, adolescents until they're fully developed, they need to take a break from throwing at some point yeah. during the year. We even shut our guys down for for a little bit. Wow. Um, depending on what year they are, there's like a four to six window. Like if we shut down in November, or we'll we'll kind of let guys take a break for a while before we start to ramp up. Um, you know, in in late December and January to get them ready for the end of February. So, I do think there's some value in that. And again, if you're playing multiple sports, that doesn't happen. Right, you know? it takes care of itself. That's right. But like, I think it's all right for kids. They should really throw a lot of fastball change up you know, to, to, until they get to a certain age, maybe it's like 13 and like learn if they can, again, this is where it's important when, you know, you talk about going and maybe getting a pitching coach, a pitching coach understands to teach a kid how the right way to spin a breaking ball because you have kids that start doing it the wrong way. And unfortunately those kids can wind up getting hurt quick. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and it's such a big way. I love it. I, I love um, what you mean to the area and, you know, we have to look at these kids um, to nurture them. You know, you want them to, to continue to love the game, you know, and, and you want to look after them. And you kind of have that, you know, you got that, you got that thing going for you, John. Welcome to Primo. How can we help you today? One old fashioned meatball and make it quick because I got practice. You got it, coach. Congratulations, coach. You've been nominated by your team to win two tickets to the big game. Wait, nominated? So I didn't win? Smile. Not it, coach. Most valuable Not coach. it. Smile, Not coach. it. Smile. Come on, smile. Smile for the cowboys, smile. coach. You got to be kidding me. Smile, coach. coach. So, coach, one of the things I just think it's it's really important for people to hear from you. You know, I, as a leader in the sports community, someone that, it, you know, it really presides over a big deal. I, I just think it, it, it parents need this, right? Like, they, they don't know what to do. There's so much out there. there it's such a, an un, like to navigate this world. Yeah, I, I think I've been really, really fortunate growing up. I had really good coaches at the young, at my like younger levels and high school legion coaches in college that, that made a you know pretty they're, they're very influential. That's probably one of the reasons why I got into coaching. Um, and I even see it now, Anthony, when kids are, are looking to go to college. 
And parents have so many questions, especially like for their first child. If they have like multiple kids, they're going to be athletes. There's a huge difference. You could tell the parents that the first time they go through the recruiting process and maybe the second or third, you know, and they're just like, I, we don't know what to do. Like what this school's talking to us. We don't know where to go. Like, is it, you know, so it's almost like, you know, you got to kind of educate them even at that point. You know, like how the recruiting process works. So I know it's a lot. And I do think this is a really good platform to get out in front of a lot of people. Because let's face it, they probably all have the same questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, because that's what I that's what I experience, you know, when it comes to recruiting and, and parents come into our, my office and they sit down and they want to know, you know, how is this going to work and, you know, what's your process? So I think there's a ton of people out there that this this will this will have to be uh, to be real value in this. Um, you know, obviously every sport's probably a little bit different, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of people out there that are asking themselves, when should we start? You know, what do we need to do? And I don't, I don't know if there's like one answer for everybody. I think it's different for every, everybody, you know, depending on skill level or what type of student they are, what type of sport they play. I think some of the advice I would give them is ask people that are a little like a little older parents that you know that have had kids go through it because they'll be able to answer a lot of those basic questions and at least like to start that you know guide you in the right way to get you off to a good start you know it, it, it's so good you reminded me of um talking about coaches and we have a mutual friend uh steve Koploff and uh, the Koploff family and uh, of course michael who uh and kenny both who pitched and and Steve t- so my so my Massimo played you know for yep. Michael and Steve and Steve said he was talking to the parents now he's old school right but he, 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 the lesson was was great stuff because he did say he's like you as parents need to always coach your kid like you always got to be on them like you just can't expect them to just every Tuesday and, and Saturday, all of a sudden pick up the game. Like you got to go out, you got to you got to throw with them. You got to treat it almost like a part time job. And I, I thought it was, it was spot on. And he's like, "Listen, if your kid's playing center field, you should be behind him in center field, telling him, yo, it's ball ready. Let's go, let's go. You don't know where to, know what the situation. Where's the ball going? Like you know." Ball comes here, where are you throw, you know, what are you doing? It was funny because Steve said, You're children, you're the parent, you know better. And so you need to, to, to enact a little, you know, a little force to them to not like, you know, go out and practice. Yeah, I think I think like a lot of that coaching and that um that encouragement needs to come in the right environment. Right. Right. I think that's really important. I think a lot of that has to do like it, it's in the practice setting a little yeah. bit more. It's yeah, when nice. you're in the car, when right. you're in the car and coming home from practice and you say, hey, Massimo, like, you know, you, you, you ran from second to third and there was a ground ball hit the shortstop and the shortstop three out of third. Like, you yeah. know, what were you thinking there, boss? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. I think that's OK to have that conversation. And like, you know, kids are going to make mistakes. Like we, everybody makes mistakes. Sure. You got to just got to learn from them. And then baseball, again, baseball is a game of failure. I, I, and I think there's a point when the game starts and I really, I feel very strongly about this, that parents, once that game starts, need to take a back seat. Yes. <laughs> I often say that in youth sports, this is, this would solve a lot of problems. And I've, <laughs> I've, I've been on record saying this and it sometimes it gets me in trouble, right? That there should be almost like a dugout right that they put out in center field that has all glass walls and a gla- so and it's soundproof and all the parents have to get shoved in there right almost <laughs> like almost like an attraction at the zoo right and you just keep them encased in there from the first pitch to the last pitch and then you let them all out at the end of the game and i think we'd all be better off for it right oh my god i love it yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, listen, you're right because I was we were, I was laughing with Steve. I go, you really are going to empower these people to go out and, and yell at their kid during the game? Like, you don't want that. Like, that's no, what no. You Steve, do. 
Steve, Steve is great. I I love Steve and that family is a great family. And they, yeah. what's great about them is that they, they have your son's best interests at, at heart. They really do. They love to teach. They I've do. seen those. I've seen him do things for, for kids in the area that, you know, normally they would maybe not be able to afford something Yeah, and he would take kids on and, and give them opportunities. And he really does care about kids. He's a really, really good guy that way. Um, yeah. And again, like when you're around people like that, you'll look back on it and be like, you know what? We were really lucky to, to come across somebody like that when, you know, when you were growing up and that's, that's great for, for people to be able it's to experience. I, I got to tell you, we met some great people, some great coaches. He's got a, uh, our man, Cesar Evangelista now who, uh, terrific guy, you know, at, uh, he, he's at Rucci baseball and, you know, you, you see these kids and, and you, these coaches and they just care. Like, you know, there's a lot of good ones, man. It's a shame that, uh, you know, the, the, the one, the few bad apples, you know, you, you got to throw it up aside. Sure. So many great people that really just care about the kids. And, and that's what kind of really what I, I want to shine the light on those people that are doing the right thing and really kind of giving back. Look, it's a thankless job. You know that, John. You know, these youth coaches, they're not getting paid. I know. You know? I know. I just my, – the other thing, my other disclaimer would be take it easy on the umpires too, especially at the at the youth level. Oh, these poor guys are out there making $30, $40 an hour, and we got parents yelling at them like it's the seventh game of the World Series at Citizens Bank, man. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> it's it, – we got to relax a little bit. Those guys are, they're not making a lot of money. And guess what? If there's no umpires, we can't play. Right. Exactly. So, you know, and you can't coaching. hold them up to the stadium. Like, look, their strike zone may be kind of erratic. Right. So what are you going to do? Like you got to yeah. allow for it. You know? Yeah. 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 You're lucky though. Anthony. You're in a good spot in South Jersey. There's some really good people down there. I grew up at, like I was born in Philly. My parents moved to South Jersey. So I know, I know a lot of the people at those circles that you're running in. Um, like Mike Rucci's a really good guy. I actually recruited him. Yes. Yeah. So we've we go way back and we're we're good friends, but there's some really good people down there. So you're in a good spot. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Listen, coach, I just want to thank you uh for sharing the message. You know, I'll probably knock on your door again. I, I just I love I love your your way. I just do. I think you're a great coach and and you love the game, you teach it. And uh I I, I love what you did for that program, man. It, God bless you. you. Did a great job. You are just killing it. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's. Um, I'm really lucky. I, I I really do love what I do. I'm in a great spot. Um, you know, this is a great place to work, and you know, it just sometimes I feel bad saying this, but um, you know, I don't really feel like I got. I have to go to work every day. You know, <laughs> I just tell people don't tell my AD that because they might try to cut my pay or something. So we don't want that <laughs> happening. But it's a uh, yeah, it's great, man. I love coaching baseball, and I was looking forward to today because it was our first day back. You know. Um, so I was just excited to bring the new guys in and, and start getting them acclimated to things. So it was a great day today. Love it, brother. Listen, uh, I'll leave you with a go birds because it'll be a fun year today. This oh year. man, I can't Eagles. wait. I can't wait, dude. I, I, I was looking at, at Kelly green jerseys today online. I'm going to have, I can't, I've been telling everybody for a year that a Reed Blankenship was going to be a good player. And now I can't, they still won't, they won't print his Jersey yet though. I said, what's it going to take for this guy? So He's my he's my dark horse this year for the for the Eagles. So yeah, baby, go birds. I can't wait to get it going. I love it, man. There he is, Peyton coach John Yurkow.